I'll tell you, commercials are interesting things. And over these last few years, they know who's watching what type of shows. And so they get commercials that are geared toward those people. And of course, Lori and I, the shows we watch, it's kind of funny because all the shows we watch, the commercials are about medicine or procedures. <laughs> That's half of them. And then the other half is suing medical companies and procedures. It's kind of, kind of weird. But there was this one show, and we got off our regular ones, and I called this a couple times, that, but it talks about Tilo years. Have, have, have many people seen that commercial, the Tilo years? Okay, probably not too many. Well, anyway, there's this 42-year-old woman that really looks in shape, and she's talking how she's 42, but in Tilo years, she's only 29. And I'm thinking, that'd be great marketing. I know a lot of 42-year-old women would love to send in and get a little certificate saying you're actually 29 or maybe 56 and you're 35. I, I think, man, they're going to make it a mint. But really, it is a genetic DNA where they look at your life expectancy and how much longer you live according to your DNA and genetics. And it's, it's kind of interesting. But I really wouldn't want to do that because I'd afraid I'd, I'd get a letter that would read something like this. Mr. Brooks we're not sure if you'll still be alive when you get this letter, you know. But um, so we're looking at vital signs. And Tyler's message last week was incredibly good. Let's give a, just a shout out to that. That's just good stuff. He was looking at our vital signs between us and our Heavenly Father. He said some things. I took about two pages of notes. Excellent. But he also made a comment that a lot of times we don't like to do vital signs. Uh, we don't like to go to the doctor. We don't like to know what's going on in our life. But today... We're going to move this from, you know, our relationship to God, but our relationship with other people. We're going to look at our vital signs with our relationships. And I think this can be very, very powerful. I'd like uh, maybe a show of hands. How many people have a problem with another person? Right now, you're having a problem with another person. That person might be sitting next to you. Just grab their hand, hold it up. Congratulations. I see a couple of joined hands there. Uh, you know, welcome to the world. We all have and will continue to have problems with people in our lives. Um, I, I wish I would have kept track, but I've done 300 plus weddings. And, um, and so something that's interesting to me is go to a wedding that I'm not performing. You know, just to watch and hear what different people say and how they, you know, maybe approach it a different way than I approach it. And this one guy, I heard about him doing this. He had the couple up there, and at the very beginning, he stopped. And he says, I, I need to tell both of you, too, that you are in over your head. Right now, <laughs> you're seriously getting married. You're in over your head. And there's a truth to that. When we get in close proximity, we're in over our head. We don't realize how sometimes we're not paired for a close proximity relationship. That's why I think marriage is tough and parenting and having parents because you get in a smaller container and you start to see that there's some relational weaknesses. Now, we're, there's a wide reason why people are here this morning. Some, I mean, you got a passion. You just couldn't wait to get here just to turn off that, all that technology and just worship God. Others are here maybe, okay, i got to go to church, kind of obligation. Some of you are here because your kids drug you here. I can't wait to, you know, be in children's ministry and they drug you here. Others are here, you know, just a variety of reasons. Some of you might be here because there's someone at home you don't want to hang out with, so this is your escape, you know. But, but one thing that's common to this group, if we go around this entire room, all of us have one thing in common. Down deep, we all desire good relationship. We have that desire, you know. We desire, man, if I just, just had a good friend, if I had, had a good relationship in my marriage or a good relationship with my, my mother-in-law, if I had a good relationship with my daughter or my parents or my siblings, every one of us want a better relationship. It's just, it's just that clear. Uh, there's a lot of studies that have been done on this, research, secular research that has proved this out, that you know we can find a brief happiness in finances or maybe some achievement or some uh, popularity, but it, it comes and goes. But where we find deep level fulfillment is in when we have good relationships. Uh, it, it's not just a secular idea, but it has deep biblical roots. We read in Luke uh, 12, 21, it says this, Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth but have not, that don't have a rich relationship with God. And that's kind of what Tyler talked on last week. That is where we find fulfillment. That's where we find contentment. And Jesus took it a step farther, loving God and loving our neighbor. That's where we find the pay dirt in life. That's where we find something that affects us not only in this life but in the life to come. 
But there's this, um, and, and that's one reason, you know, I think we have that desire. That's one reason for the life groups. It, it just, just that practice of learning how to do life together in some of these containers with other people that love Jesus is so powerful. So I want to encourage you in that as well. But running parallel with this first idea we put up there, every one of us wants a better relationship. There's another parallel idea that happens. Every one of us seems willing to put their relationship at risk kind of weird you know we desire better relationships but every one of us now I want, I want us to think and track a little bit on this we seem like we're willing to gamble a little bit with our good relationships we we, we kind of like it's, it's the greatest thing we have it's the most important thing but we often do unsafe unhealthy things with our relationship we're real quick to maybe put our career in front of it a couple more hours at the office or, you know, hey, there's a couple ball games. I'm just going to watch four this afternoon, four football games. You know, and, and we, we, we take these risks that we kind of gamble. Well, they'll understand. Sometimes we even manipulate some of our good relationships for our advantage. What can, I need to get something out of this. Uh, what can I do to get more coming toward me in this relationship? Sometimes we avoid hard conversations that we need to have in those relationships. Sometimes we never really put a lot of investment into those important relationships, but we still want a, we still want a big return. Sometimes we get checked out with distraction. I mean, when we're with that important person the entire time, that entire evening, we're on a little, our little Facebook, or we're on our little computer, and, and we're not giving that face-to-face -face time. And I, I've, I've done a lot of counseling through the years, and sat there and sometimes I say, let me reinterpret what you are saying here in your marriage. Let me reinterpret what you're saying. And sometimes I'll say this to some of the men, let me reinterpret what you're saying. You're basically saying or asking, what's the least I can do to keep my wife happy? What's the least I can do not to get in trouble? What's the least I can do to please my husband? And so often, that's a type of gamble. We, 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 we risk that. You know, after we get in this relationship, maybe, for, maybe a group of, maybe a, a friend that we've had for our life, sometimes we take them for granted. And then we make the assumption that it'll be okay. It'll be okay. They'll understand. I know there's a lot of statistics about broken marriages and relationships and stuff like that, but I'm, I'm going to be the exception. I'm going to miss out on that because my intentions are good. Every one of us, that first statement, every one of us has that desire, and we think, you know, I really love them. I, I really love my kids, and they really love me, and, and we start gambling with our time, and we think, hey, I've got 18 years with those kids. I'll get back around to it, but one day, we're kind of like a, a Batman uh, type of cartoon, you know, the, the bam, boom, smack, and the next thing we know, I'm not the exception anymore. And one of the most painful things, and I can testify to this, one of the most painful things in life is where you have a broken relationship. It's so painful. It's so real. Stuff was left unsaid or uh, trust was broken or consistency was lost and and, and we've let things go too long, and then it's, you can't put it back together again. And so today, this is, a, this is a tender conversation, you know. This is a touchy conversation. It, I, I feel like many people in here, it can be very painful uh, to navigate, you know, when we've had a relationship breakdown. You know, when we've, we've, there's many in here that maybe you've had a failed marriage, and that's real. It still, still messes with you. You had a business partner, and you had a great product, and you all were so excited. How many late nights you spent together just planning, and you went into business together, and here, two or three latest years later, you, you've gone through a lawsuit with them, and, and you no longer talk. Or there's people that, that sometimes you, you see in the store, and it's like, you know, that cold sweat break, I can't see them. They're on aisle two, so you dart in real quick to aisle seven, and you're just kind of, you know, kind of watching and waiting for them to go by. You know, you're, you're, you're just playing with the product, you know, just waiting for them to go by, and all of a sudden your five-year-old pulls your knee and says, Daddy, why are we in the mama underwear section? Oh, <laughs> you know, and you, you do things just to avoid that because of, of just that pain and, and, and different things that are, that are going on. And... Uh, um, you know, we made this observation at Christmas about homeless people. One of the thing, one of the biggest statistics I see about them, they have burned so many bridges. They have no relationships in their life. Relationships are so important. That's one of the most important things. So we, for these next few moments, we're going to look at six vital signs for relationships. Six of them, okay? And these six, and, and the way we're going to look at them, 
uh, or for healthy relationships, healthy life-giving relationships. The way we're going to look at them is it'll help us to maybe grade ourselves, to maybe see where we're missing it, how we can improve. But it also, within each one of these, it'll tell us how we can improve. It's the answer is also in, in the question. It's there together. Um, I think it'd be cool to maybe note where you feel like you're at on this. The, the bad thing is if we grade ourselves, we'll probably give ourselves a pass because we have good intentions. Every one of us, you know, I want to be a good husband. I want to be a good dad. I, I do the best I can. I really mean to, but some, sometimes our actions are different. And I was thinking, how can we grade ourselves? We could ask our mate, and they would gladly give us a grade. They would get the red pen out, and, you know, we would all flunk, you know, because, you, know, you know, they'd catch us on a lot of things. But maybe you have a, have a good friend, a brother, you know, that you know in the Lord or sister that you could sit down and say, hey, could you help grade me on some of this? Where am I at? What do you see in my life, you know? Uh, and and I, I think that's important. Now, as we, we, because we're all in, when we talk about relationships, we are all in over our heads. Now, when I was studying this, I ran into some material by Scott Scruggs, and he found some stuff. I said, hey, I've got to share that. Now, I'm going to share some of his stuff, but I'm going to add some of my flavor to it, but this is where I got some of it, and he got it from Paul in this verse in Colossians 3, 12 through 14. And I want to read this, and this is where we find these six uh, vital signs. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dear beloved, clothe yourself with, and here's a six, compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, bear with one another, and the sixth one, forgive one another as you have a grievance, a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. So we see these six here, and very similar to the fruit of the Spirit, which we talked about over the summer, but there's a little bit different spin, I think, that we can apply to relationships that can be healthy for us here this morning. The word compassion, we're going to start with the first one. Compassion, the, the root word, where it comes from, might surprise you because it's actually better translated as bowels, you know, B-O-W-L-S, you know, kind of gross. You know, it's our gut. It's our gut. And, and I think we, if we understand that this vital sign, we measure it from our gut, it will help a lot. It's where we digest stuff. It's our digestive system. And you know how our digestive system works? We eat something that goes down there, our digestive system says, oh, yeah, this would be good. No, that won't be good. And so I kind of threw out this terminology, flushing, you know, there's stuff that we keep and other stuff we flush out of our system, you know. And sometimes in relationships, whether we realize it or not, we have an active flusher. We flush too much. And you, some of you know this time of year that some of you have been flushing a lot of stuff out of your system. It's not a good position to be in. It can be life-threatening if you keep flushing stuff out of your system. But that's how we need to measure how are we treating people. And so often, whether we realize it or not, we have a very active flush system with people. And this, this can begin to, to mess with us. They look different, <laughs> flush them. You know, they think different, I'm going to flush them. You know, I, I struggle with some people, you know, because they're Watsontonians or Tetonians or Jamaicans, you know, flush, 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 you know, or, or they're, they're, they're Democratic liberals, flush them. They're Republican conservatives, flush them, you know, and, and, and they're, they're in a different social status, flush them. You know, they're a Cubs fan, flush, 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 you know, they're, they're in management. And, and before we know it, we have this active, you know, it, it's like this memory, and we do that. And unaware sometimes when we have groups of people we don't like when we get in a discussion with some of our close relationships and it doesn't line up well just flush them you know so we've got to look at our gut we've got to look at our compassion because we can do it with our kids we can do it with our parents and again a key scripture Matthew 5 43 through 45 you have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemy, bless those that curse you, do good to those that hate you, pray for those that spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes the sun to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust. I want to tell you that prayer is probably one of the best uh, prescriptions for unhealthy, flushing compassion gut feeling 
You know, it's something about that. And if you're out there today or I'm out there today where there's maybe large groups of people that I don't like, I need to, or politicians I don't like or individuals, I need to begin praying for those people to get that root of compassion deeper in my life so that I'm just not flushing. It's just you're so used to it that when you're made or someone you love, boop, we just do that, you know. But if we'll stop and we'll begin to pray, God can heal that. And so I want us to think about that. Are we flushing a lot of people in our life? Do we f- sometimes flush, you know, the way to cure that is prayer. I, I, I love the statement in Matthew 9 uh, where Jesus, he said, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. You know, a variety of people from all over. It was just like out of his gut, he's moved compassion because he saw that they were wearied and scattered like sheep, having no shepherd. One thing that prayer does, sometimes people can really aggravate you, but as you pray for them, all of a sudden you start to get a spirit of understanding. That's why they're that way. That's where they're coming from. And something that I've learned through the years that sometimes my richest, some of my richest memories, some of the better relationships I had have come from people that are really different than me. But you learn that flavor. You catch that, boy, they they look at life different than I do. And sometimes it can be a very good and very healthy and a life-giving thing. But pray. The second thing that comes up that he mentions in that Colossian scripture is kindness. Say kindness. I want to be real clear. Kindness doesn't mean being nicer. You know, I need, maybe today I need to be nicer. You know, Jesus wasn't a nicer kind of day type person when you look at his life because we find Jesus rebuking people. We find Jesus many times with, with, with people, um, you know, um, you know, even when he went into the synagogue one time, he, he cleared everything out. He cast everything out. He set the record straight. He turned over tables. He, he would call them out. And we see that Jesus wasn't one of these like, hey, I'm going to be nicer today. But the original word, now this is what kindness means, and, and it's really kind of powerful. It's the capacity to encourage. Kindness encourages people. It builds up people. So when we walk in relationships with kindness, we start to build up our closest friends. We start to build up people around us. We leave a trail that, boy, it was good to be with them. I was kind of discouraged today, but after I got with my mate, man, I feel more encouraged with life. After I got with my friend, I feel like I can handle stuff. There's that encouragement. There's that kindness factor. It leaves a trail, but so often we don't leave a kindness trail. It's kind of like, oh, I had a talk with them. That ruined my day or that ruined my morning or talk to mom or ruined ruined my after I talk, going to go home and, and see my child. I'm going to ruin their day. And we need to look at this kindness. We need to evaluate how kind are we? How is that working for us? There's a man by the name of John Gottman. John Gottman. And he's a noted researcher in the area of marriage. I have never heard of him. But Scott Scruggs had. So he shared that. I said, okay, I'll take, you, take that from you, Scott. Uh, John Gottman is a noted person in the, in the research of marriage. And he ran upon something, and he did a lot of surveys and a lot of reviews on this. He found one item that determined whether marriage would last or not. One item. It was just in every situation. He found this, and the one item was the presence of encouragement, the presence of kindness. When it was there, marriages would last. When it wasn't there, marriages would fall apart. Now, this is how he did it. He would have these couples do tally marks. How often do you today, do you get angry? Do you say negative words? Do you judge? Do you correct? Do you point out what your mate is doing wrong and then tally how many times you do that you know have your both of you tally it up how many times a day do you you touch your mate not not this but you know touch your mate you say encouraging things you build them up you say kind things so those were the two tallies and what he found out when a couple had five acts of kindness and encouragement touch good things to be said over one correction you did this wrong let me point out what you did wrong anger five to one that marriage would last anything greater than that if it was five to two five to three that marriage wouldn't go the distance of time and then the wild thing john gottman found out he ran into some marriages that were (laughs) crazy good it was just like it was just like what in the world's going on he found out the ratio was 20 to one just that important kindness is that 
powerful. Hebrews 3, 13 puts it this way. Hebrews, are you guys out there? Y'all just seem real quiet. Please be kind to me today. 3.13, here we go. But encourage one another. How often? Oh, I was nice yesterday. You know, first of the week I was nice. Daily, as long as it's called a day. So take every opportunity while we're alive so that none of you may become hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Kindness keeps things soft and pliable, but things start to get really hard when we don't use kindness. So a uh, fellow in the Bible by the name of Barnabas. How many people have heard of Barnabas? Yeah. My dad is a crazy, he's, for the last 15 years, he's really studied and devoured any material he can find on Barnabas. Barnabas, believe it or not, he's well referred to throughout the Bible and throughout biblical history. My dad has found, even the Bible indicates this, he was a key person in Paul finding his place in ministry. He was a key person in Silas and John Mark. So many people he was responsible for for sending out ministry. He was a behind-the-scenes powerful uh, force that was there when the early church started. But Barnabas isn't even his name. His name is Joseph, but he got a nickname. And Barnabas simply means son of encouragement. It basically means how we translate it today. Here comes Mr. Encouragement. I mean, when churches were down, when people were discouraged about children's ministry, when people were discouraged about the coffee bar ministry, when people were discouraged about, you know, their neighbor or discouraged, he would come along and he would encourage them, and he'd just pump life into people, and they could go forward. Barnabas, Barnabas. What's, What's our nickname? What would our kids call us? What's their nickname for us? Here comes Mr. Grumpy. Here comes the enforcer. You know, here, here comes the micromanager, you know. Or what would our mates say? What, what, what would they, they call us? Here comes Mr. Negative. Here comes Mrs. Goody Two-Shoes. Here comes the correct all, you know. Here comes the judge, you know. But what about if our, if our kids and our mates said, man, I love going home. Is that such encouragement? I've had, let me just talk to Dad. Let me just talk to mom. Let me just talk to my son. He he always encourages me. It's that powerful in relationship. They're few and far in between, but so so powerful. The third thing is humility. Uh, We've talked a lot about this. A lot of people trying to figure out what humility is. Uh, Tyler talked some about it last week. Philippians 2, uh, 3 and 5. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or self-driven or vain deceit. Rather, in humility... Here's a definition, valuing others above yourself, not looking on your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. Humility is basically um, placing others ahead of us. It's just that simple. It's I'm thinking about other people. I'm thinking about my son more than I'm thinking about me. I'm thinking about my wife more than I'm thinking about me. I'm thinking about my fellow worker and where they're at more than me. I'm thinking more about Tyler than I'm thinking about me. That's what humility is, where you think about other people more than yourself. You think about, I, I, I want to hear your dreams. I want to listen to your plan. I want to li- hear your agenda for the day. Humility does that. It steps out of that self position where, hey, what am I going to do today? What's going to make me happy? What do I want to eat? I don't want that in my food, you know? And, and, and it thinks about who is around you. It's not elevating self, but it elevates the people around you. And a question might be if we want to evaluate ourselves, how often? What percentage of your day do you spend thinking about those relationships that are in your life? How often during the day do you think about your mate and what they need and what's going on in their life and their struggles and their plans and their dreams? How often are you thinking about your parents and how are they doing today and what's happening with them? How often do you think about your fellow worker? Okay, kind of grade yourself on that. Next thing is gentleness. Uh, Paul, as he's teaching on the vital signs of relationship health, he understands that any relationship at times, they face tension. You know, and I, I know some of you probably this week might have had some good knockout, drag out fights with some people that are close in your life. It happens. There's ability for fire to sometimes get out of control in a marriage or in a home between a, you know, things, things happen. Um, you know, even when you discipline a child, you know, when you come home and, you know, you, you realize that the portable basketball rim is sticking through the roof of your truck and you realize my truck wasn't there and that rim was, but they're together. You know, at times like that, what, what, do, you, what do you do? What, how, does, how does gentleness 
respond. I, I'll tell you one thing my dad always did, and I think there's a lot of wisdom to it. <laughs> you know, I really learned every time he corrected me. Man, I learned. I mean, he helped me learn every time I did something wrong. But there were just so many new things to experience, you know. It was just like I always found something else to get in trouble with. But he would always say, Van, uh, I'll tell you what, why don't you go up to your room for about 30 minutes, and I'll come up and talk to you. And I never understood what was going on, but it gave him time just to take a breath. It, it, it gave him time not to, to, to kill me, you know. It gave, you know, and I think there's some wisdom because when I look at gentleness, it's the ability, we got it up there, it's the ability to stay tender when you have to be tough. It's the ability to stay tender when you have to be tough. Sometimes your mate, your husband, or your wife has done something that's really just, I mean, I cannot believe they did that. And it's so easy to come out, you know, machetes, you know, machine gun fire, you know, and just say, take, take a breath. Because it's, you know, I think of Jesus with the woman at the well. He's dealing with a woman that doesn't get it. And I mean, she's had five husbands. The one she's living with now is not the one. And, and, and Jesus, when you look at that conversation, he's so gently, he's so tender, but he's tough with her, very tender in leading her back to God. He could have very religiously turned her off from God and just condemned her and called fire from heaven. But you can see it's like laser surgery, very gentle. Um, I remember one of my children uh, ended up getting a very large fishing hook all the way through their hand. I mean, it was on this side, and it came out that other side, you know. So right away I says, you know, might need to go to the ER. So I go to the ER, and so we get in the ER, and this is a, my, my child was about six years, six years old. It was my daughter. She's about six years old. Wasn't real excited in that condition. And so the doctor finds a piece of equipment that they probably never use, and it probably four or $5,000. Have you ever seen these bolt cutters? This thing was stainless steel polish. It probably spent five, $6,000 for it. And so anyway, he's coming in. Here's my daughter like, hmm, you know, you know, he come, oh, look what I got. He's chasing the nurse around with it. He's chasing the technician around with it. Hey, I'm in, I'm in. And my daughter's like, she is freaking out, you know. Come over here, honey. Ah, you, know, you know, and so often we don't have that tenderness. We're coming, I'm going to set this straight. <laughs> Why are you running from it? You need to listen, you know, and it's not, it's, it's not precision surgery. It's not like over this issue, but let me talk to you about your childhood. Let me talk to you about two weeks back. Let me talk to you about, you know, just chopping. It's like, hey, let's do an amputation here, and there's just a splinter. There's just a, you know, that needs to come out, you know. And so gentleness is important with relationship that we're very skillfully, we restore, we, we build someone up, we, we deal with just that issue, not tons of other issues. And, you know, and we need to look at ourselves. Do we deal with stuff with angry expression? Do we have overkill? Do we, we come on strong? Do we lack tenderness in tough situations? Fifth one is patience. Patience basically just means long suffering. It's interesting I always think this is funny how, you know, when it talks about the fruit of the Spirit, it, it, it puts kindness and long-suffering right together. Because sometimes we can be kind for about 15 minutes, you know, or we can, we can put up with the person for a long time and not be kind. But we need both of them to, together. But long-suffering means the long haul. It's not quick to bail out. Long-suffering paints this amazing picture of being alongside of a friend for a lifetime, being alongside of a mate for a lifetime. That's where in the marriage vows we have for better or what? Yeah, I've had some of that worse, right? We've also had some worse. For richer, for poor, in sickness. Yeah, they're, they're not physically sick, but they're sick. You know, sickness or health, we have these, we have these things going on, and, and it's so easy to bail out. It's so easy to say, hey, it's tough, man. I, I just can't take it any longer. I've, the whole last year has been bad, you know. But in relationships, we need to understand that relationship suffers the up and down of people. You know, there's times in a marriage that a husband or wife will, will lose a job or there'll be a loss of a child or there'll be a physical thing going on or uh, there's a lot of issues fine there's a lot of speed bumps there's sin issues that we're all working through there's imperfection and there's no way that relationships aren't going to have some of that going on and so maybe ask this question how well do we walk with a friend during maybe an ugly time in their life how many people have ever had an ugly time in their life aren't you glad that someone didn't give up on you or 
maybe they're in some self-inflicted just mess. Sometimes we, and, and someone that walks with you, whether it's a child or a maid or a neighbor, we are called to be patient because Jesus is patient with us. And the last is, is forgiveness. Isn't that a co-winky dink, forgiveness? Because at some point, our closest friend, whether it's our maid or best friend throughout our life, they're going to really hurt us. And, and, and the reason why, it's interesting. I mean, you can go to the grocery store or in traffic and someone can roll down their window and yell and cuss you out and stuff like that. It might mess with you a minute, but not very long because you're not close to that person. But when you're really close to someone and they say sometimes the smallest thing or, or, or they say something, it can hurt so deeply. They let you down. They dropped you off a, a cliff. Or maybe they pushed you to jump over a cliff. cliff. And we say things that we shouldn't. Uh, things come out of our mouth that we shouldn't. But so often in, in a friendship, you know, we can either forgive or not forgive. Uh, and when that happens so often, we put up walls. We, we lock doors. We put landmines out there. You know, we... We, we, we start this kind of legal case with them that, you know, for two or three days we're just as, just as mad as a wet hen, and I don't know what that is at all, but we're mad like that, you know. You know and, 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 and then we finally come to the place that, okay, I need to forgive you, but let me set out the terms for the peace settlement. Isn't it interesting how we, okay, we're going to no- negotiate peace. And this, is, this is the restribution you're going to have to pay doing that this is how long you're going to experience the cold shoulder this is when communication will be resumed this is when after you go through these different service projects and these honeydews this is where we can get back to to ground zero but paul in this verse you know the, the colossians verse he he says to forgive not because it's easy did you know it's not easy to forgive okay no one it's, it's not easy to forgive. Um, and not because they ask for it, not because they deserve it, but he says, you need to forgive because Jesus did that for you. Have you ever heard this statement? You don't even understand. You, you don't have a clue what you did. I mean, you're asking forgiveness, but you're going to do it again because you... You're out in the dark on this. You don't even understand. How many people have thought that or said that? Liars. <laughs> we've all done that. You know, we've all thought that. But notice, notice the statement that Jesus made. He said, he said, forgive them. Forgive them. They don't even know what they are doing. See in context where he's at? Forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. He's on the cross when he's saying that. They don't know what we we killed Jesus. We did not have a clue what we're doing. Another time, Jesus said this. He said, "You know, you know, you know." Pete, James, and John had him corner. Says, "How often should I forgive a brother?" And Jesus said, seven times seventy in a day." So here's a question. Maybe this is an interesting question. How quickly do we forgive? Just think, how quickly do we forgive? How often do we forgive the same person on the same day for the same daggum thing? Is that interesting? Are we really slow with that? How often do we forgive the same person on the same day for the same daggum thing? Interesting questions. Interesting vital signs. Will you stand up with me? I'm going to ask, I think Ben's coming up here, and you might say, who is this guy? This is our worship leader from Newton, and he's hanging out with us today, and Luke is over there, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, this is Ben. He's a lot of fun. See him around staff, and so he's going to be leading us in a song as we pray. And so this is, this is where we're going to go with this. If, if you need some help, or maybe in any area, but maybe in the area of friendship, I'm going to ask if we could have some leaders just kind of stand up here. And if you'd come down and, and these people are here to, to pray with you, maybe you're struggling for something, uh, anything, but maybe in a friendship. Or if you'd like to maybe just come up here and kneel down by yourself and just pray by yourself, maybe this is where you can say, hey, there's, you know, there's Watsonians. I, I struggle with people from that, that region of Illinois. I, I need to start praying for those people, you know. Or I need to start praying 
I need to start a prayer ministry for those liberals, or I need to start a prayer ministry for those conservatives that are driving me crazy, you know, and, and begin to, to work on your flush mechanism, and, and prayer is one of the best things, you know. Maybe you need to pray, pray a, a little bit. Lord, give me the capacity. Just help me understand that capacity because my, my husband right now doesn't, he's clueless. And I know I was clueless when I put you on the cross, but I, I need to pray. So we're going to take a few minutes. Ben's going to lead us in a song. Then I'm going to come back up here and we'll close out.